Can everyone hear me? On the chat? Yes. Great, thank you. So, uh, um, Okay. So, uh, happy new year, everyone. Um, we're having two papers today again. Um, I'm gonna present um, Duster. Um, this is a bit of a longer paper than usual. Um, so it might take a bit long. Um, okay, uh, so um, Duster Geometric 3D Vision Made Easy uh, was a paper that came over Came out over the weekend, uh, over the holidays, I guess, um, and it's about um, solving three D geometry all together. Um, so it's mostly a new paradigm for doing things that um, we had pipelines for before. Um, so um, to uh, cover what three D geometry uh, or three D vision mostly is about, uh, the whole pipeline looks something like this. Uh, in all the papers that we've seen. So uh, there are a bundle of images um, and uh, from one scene. And first you want to find the camera parameters for these images. So to find the camera parameters, you do most of the times uh, three steps. Uh, so first you find the uh, image features. You've mostly seen SIFT or like uh, deep learning versions of SIFT. Uh, for uh, this step, and then uh, you um, find matches between these uh, features. Uh, and uh, after you have developed matches um, through uh, algorithms like Ransack and stuff, um, you can start finding uh, camera parameters and a smart uh, a sparse point cloud for the scene using these key points that you have found. And this step is called bundle adjustment, and it's a big optimization. Uh, over the camera parameters and uh, point uh, 3D point coordinates. Uh, and it's mostly done through uh, reprojection error optimization. So you uh, uh, you optimize for 3D uh, coordinates uh, and cameras uh, that uh, when you project those points through these cameras, you get the key points um, that uh, you have matched between the uh, views. Uh, so, uh, also, if there's any questions, please interrupt me here. Um, okay, so after you found this uh, parameter, camera parameters and uh, point clouds, uh, you then do stuff like uh, multi-view uh, synthesis and uh, dense reconstruction. Uh, so in this part, you just uh, extend your uh, sparse point cloud to a dense uh, point cloud that uh, represents the 3D scene. So most of the papers in NERF that you see, the first three st steps are done with cool map, and then the last step is done with NERF for uh, 3D Gaussians. Again, NERF and 3D Gaussian does a little bit more than just LVS, and they can do null view synthesis too, but here we just want to uh, find the uh, corresponding 3D uh, point for each pixel that we have seen in this image bond. Uh, so, uh, this is the whole pipeline when you have a bundle of images. Uh, a, a, a small uh, derivation that sometimes we see is that we have a single image and uh, we use some geometric priors like uh, um, big networks that are trained and big data. Uh, and uh, we find the uh, depth image for uh, that uh, image. And uh, with camera and intrinsics, we can uh, convert that depth image to 3D coordinate. So this is another. Uh, paradigm that you mostly have seen before. Okay, so uh, what does Duster want to do? Duster wants to have a pair of images uh, with unknown cameras as input. Actually, it can be more than a pair, but it starts with a pair. Uh, and then uh, the goal is to uh, introduce a new paradigm for uh, a dense 3D reconstruction uh, of those uh, images. Uh, and the output from this are like multiple things, like all the uh, basically all the tasks in 3D vision. So you can get a dense point cloud, you can get relative poses of the cameras, you can get depth maps, camera intrinsics, and uh, key point matches. Um, 
And the reason that this paper is interesting is that it's, uh, it's gonna introduce a very simple way to do all of these tasks that before was done with different pipelines and all were really heavily engineered. Um, okay. So uh, going into their method, uh, the representation that they use uh, is called point maps. Um, so what is a point map? Uh, a point map matches each pixel in an image to a 3D coordinate in the camera frame of that image. Uh, so uh, the point map is shown here with X and it's uh, the size of the image, but the three uh, dimensions here are the, uh, are the point coordinates uh, in the uh, same camera frame camera uh, coordinate. Uh, so um, uh, if you have this point map, the relationship between this point map and depth map is, for example, uh, discussed, uh, can be uh, expressed this way. Uh, so this is just uh, going, uh, if you've worked with uh, NERF before, you know this is just going from um, image space uh, to uh, camera space. And K is the intrinsic matrix. Um, and also, if you uh, have uh, X expressed in its own camera frame, uh, you can express it in another uh, image's uh, camera frame, uh, shown as NM here. So uh, the points from image N expressed in uh, camera frame N uh, through uh, just uh, a rigid transformation uh, between the uh, using the camera pose of N and uh, the inverse camera pose of N and the camera pose of N. H here is just a homogeneous map. Um, so, uh, so this is what a point map is and how it relates to the stuff that uh, are commonly known, like camera poses and uh, intrinsic and depth. Okay. So um, now that we know what a point map is, uh, the uh, the method that they uh, introduce uh, wants to uh, take two uh, images as input and regress uh, point maps uh, as output. And it's a fully supervised method. So the point maps are uh, just uh, 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 supervised through a simple L2 loss. Uh, and okay, so the architecture that they, uh, so the, uh, before I get into the ar architecture, the smart thing that they do in this um, method is that they just don't like take one image, one monocular uh, image and try to find the 3D points, uh, like the single uh, image uh, reconstructions that I told you about. Uh, they take two images and uh, they want to use a transformer uh, mechanism to find the matches between them potentially. And, and the important thing is that the uh, the point coordinates for the second image is expressed in the camera frame of the first image. So this gives you a, a very nice uh, way of uh, being able to infer about camera poses afterwards if you have the points of one image uh, expressed in the uh, frame of another image, camera frame of another image. Uh, so, okay, so have that in mind as uh, why we're doing this. Um, so uh, the uh, architecture uh, is a simple, well, it's not a simple, but it's a, a transformer based on a previously uh, introduced paper. Uh, and it takes uh, the two images, encodes them uh, into features one and two, uh, and then decoder um, uh, uh, uses cross attention between the features of the first image and the second image through its blocks and uh, uh, makes a, a several uh, representations G that can then be concatenated and given to uh, the regression head that uh, predicts the point maps. Uh, it also uh, predicts the confidence map that I will talk about. Uh, so yeah, so the output is finally just two uh, point maps in the camera coordinates of the first camera um, and uh, it gives you for each pixel the 3D uh, location in that camera frame. Okay, so uh, as I said, the training of this network is completely supervised um, and it's done using several uh, uh, synthetic and real data sets. 
uh, it's just a, uh, I guess, L1 was. Uh, I guess I said L2 before, sorry. Uh, and um, it's normalized because uh, the scale of a reconstruction is ambiguous. So we normalize it with this uh, mean of uh, distances to uh, origin uh, for the ground. Um, and the final loss is just this regression loss uh, weighted by the confidence maps. So we um, predict the confidence map for both of these because uh, some of the points can be translucent and, and like be ambiguous like sky and stuff like that. So we can't really output a 3D coordinate for them. And the assumption here is that all the surfaces are uh, solid and the ray hits them and stops there. So if it doesn't go, uh, from, like doesn't uh, apply, this rule doesn't apply to them, the confidence should be low. Should be low. So uh, we have the confidence uh, to, uh, uh, to weight the uh, loss period. And also we regularize the confidence so it's uh, not zero for all of them. Um, and we, uh, they apply the, this uh, value to the, uh, this function to their uh, confidence value. So it's always bigger than one. Okay, so now how this can uh, work for the stuff that we want, uh, like the downstream tests. So one task is, the first task is uh, key point matching. That, that is easy. So uh, you have two uh, images and their, uh, bond, uh, and their corresponding 3D points in uh, one uh, camera frame. So for each pixel, you just have to find the nearest uh, points in the 3D in the uh, other uh, images, uh, 3D uh, points. Uh, and you can do this for both of them and find the one that is smaller. Um, so the key point matching is just the nearest ne neighbor finding in the uh, 3D points that uh, were found. Um, and then we have the intrinsic. So for intrinsic, we they just uh, assume that uh, the focal length is um, unknown. Uh, so the principal point is like the center and stuff like that, and there's no distortion and stuff like that. Uh, so for the focal length, you can just optimize uh, this formulation, which is um, which is just going from uh, uh, camera space to image space. So I and J are the pixel uh, are the uh, pixel location, and uh, these it's I J. Uh, 0, 1, 2 is just the 3D uh, location uh, in the camera frame that we found. Uh, and we can optimize for the focal link. Uh, also, you can find depth map using that uh, formula that I showed uh, in the first slide uh, and find the depth maps too for that image. OK, so the two more interesting uh, parts are the camera poses and the uh, 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 global uh, adjustment for more than a pair. So uh, for uh, pairwise uh, camera poses, you just uh, have to give in the um, image, uh, the pair of images twice to the uh, network. So uh, once uh, you give uh, these two images to this network and find it, uh, the points for one of the images in its own camera frame, the other time you flip the order and find those points in the other camera coordinate uh, frame. Um, and uh, this way you have uh, the same points in two camera coordinate frames. So they should be uh, corresponding to each other using just the rigid transformation between the two. And you can optimize for the rigid transformation. Uh, take note that because these are between two passes of the network, they are not necessarily in the same scale. So you need a scale uh, parameter too. Sorry, well, I'm, I'm trying to follow the notation. So aren't they the same? Camera coordinates can go back to three slides. Uh, like three slides. So the output here is both of them are the camera oh. coordinates, yeah. camera one coordinate frame. Yeah. So again, next time you just flip the order and get it in the camera coordinate of uh, camera two. And yeah. then uh, you have just the points for the first image, but in two camera coordinates. Um, and that's just a like rigid transformers. Oh. Um, okay, now we want this same thing, but for all of the cameras. So if in, in case you have like more than two uh, images. 
so uh, this is just the extension of this, but it's a bit more complicated. So I um, just want to talk about it. Uh, so um, when you have like n cameras uh, and images, you can uh, form a, uh, a graph, uh, a pairwise graph between them. So this graph here is noted with V and this curly E here. So we are just the graph nodes and E are the edges that pair, uh, that shows the pairwise connection between them. You can have a full graph and then do pair by pair matching and uh, uh, doing this that I'm gonna explain, but it's uh, gonna be a bit slow and hard. So it's better if you just choose the pairs that are better matched. So for that, you can use one of the classical ways of image retrieval that just finds two images that look more most similar to them to each other. Um, and there are multiple ways to do that. Um, another way that they do with their method uh, is that they just uh, input every two pairs to their uh, pipeline, get the confidence maps and the ones that have a uh, sum of the, a smaller sum of confidence, sorry, a bigger sum of confidence. That means that uh, they have better matches. Uh, so they just uh, threshold the sum of confidence maps and uh, just use the pairs that have big confidence. That's how they make this graph. Okay, uh, after they have the graph, uh, the way that they optimize for the whole bundle uh, is that they optimize for uh, 3D points in a global in a global coordinates uh, frame. Uh, that is this curly X or um, chi here. Uh, and um, and so uh, they for each pixel in each image that you have, you will have one uh, global coordinate that you want to optimize. Uh, and then um, for each pair of images, uh, you can uh, uh, rigidly transform the uh, coordinates uh, that were found to uh, match to this global frame. Uh, so because each image is in more than one pair, uh, this uh, optimization uh, tries to find uh, solutions for both this uh, poses uh, PE and this uh, uh, global coordinates that matches uh, all of your uh, constraints found through a pairwise uh, uh, a pairwise uh, point matches that you have found. Um, yeah, so uh, any questions here? Um, yeah, so uh, basically it's just a bigger uh, optimization between all or most possible pairs than this one to go to a global um, coordinates. Okay, so there are a lot of quantitative results. I'm not gonna show all. Um, the, the catch is that uh, although it's like competitive results for all of them, most of the time, it doesn't perform better than the SOTAs and before, but it's just a new paradigm that just solves all of them together. Um, so two of them, which were more most interesting, is both estimation and MVS. And you can see for both traditional and uh, learning-based uh, ones, uh, Duster doesn't perform better most of the times, but um, it's reasonable. Uh, performance. Uh, for MVS, it's actually a little bit low, uh, but pose estimation is good. And these are some of the results. So again, here you have to keep in mind this is dense reconstruction, not nerf, so it's not supposed to fill in these empty spaces. Um, and these are all uh, data sets that we haven't seen before. So for example, uh, real estate 10K, it hasn't seen. Uh, and this is a real scene. Um, and it just can find all of the poses and reconstruction easily. So yeah, that was my paper. Uh, yeah. So let me see. So they can output like dense point clouds and the camera poses mostly as uh, final output. Um, and it's also very fast. So uh, 
um, they say uh, for a like small uh, or medium scene, it takes uh, less than a minute. So. You said that it's trained on synthetic and and real. Yes, it's, yeah. Uh, there were like I guess seven or something. I think. Yeah, so it's like habitat and um, about that full 3D version to scan it plus plus rather than VS. The ones that are synthetic, they have the camera poses. The ones that they don't, they use foam. Um, I guess, but most of them have the ground poses. Okay, so no questions. We can move on to the next. Okay, um, I will present a line of Gaussians, uh, text to 40 with dynamic 3D Gaussians and composed diffusion models. Um, so what this work does is it generates from text 40 um, or dynamic 3D assets um, using the formable 3D Gaussians. So here you can see like different um, different objects generated just from text. So um, basically it can yeah, generate any kind of uh, dynamic objects. Um, quickly about like one related work, um, which is make a video 3D. Um, so how this method works is it can also generate any dynamic 3D asset from text. And it uses um, a combination of text to image and text to video models, which are pre-trained on large scale data and basically uses um, dream fusion type of SDS losses to um, to train like a dynamic nerve. So in this case, it's a hex plane uh, representation. So you have like static planes and dynamic planes and you basically first pre-train the model um, only on the text to image model, uh, like a static asset, and then you fine-tune it with the text-to-video model um, um, basically to be dynamic. And overall, this works really well, but like the motion, uh, the, the quality, as you can see, is really blurry. Um, how the method uh, align your Gaussians works, it's actually really similar. So um, the main difference is, first of all, like the representation. So instead of using um, like a hex plane representation, so like a nerve representation, they use um, 3D Gaussians. And um, in the main, like one main problem was uh, in the make a video 3D is that the representation is like entangled. So the static and the dynamic part are like kind of entangled in the planes. And what they do here is like they first train um, the 3D Gaussians and then can disentangle like the deformation um, uh, from the static part. And by this, it's kind of, yeah, better better disentangle the, the motion from the from the geometry and appearance. Um, how this works, it's, it's really similar. So they use a text to video and text to image model, which are pre-trained. And um, the text to image model is mainly used to give it like good 3D geometry and appearance and the text to video model is for um, learning like the motion. Um, so text to image in this case mean, means actually it's two diffusion models. It's one text to image like a normal stable diffusion model and they also use a text to multi view image um, in this case MV dream. Um, to give it like multi-view supervision um, uh, during training. Um, 
so how does so this is what I mentioned with the static stage. So it's like two diffusion models. One, the text to multi view image diffusion model, which uses um, four orthogonal views um, to guide basically the model to have good 3D structure. And the text to image diffusion model is mainly there to give it um, more realistic appearance. Um, so how does the how do the results look like? So here they show some. Um, also like the deformations, how they go uh, um, over the time. Um, maybe here as a comparison to uh, make a video 3D, which was the previous method, you can see that make a video 3D has like these blurry, like cartoonish artifacts. And um, in comparison, they have like much higher quality. Uh, one reason is like, um, because they use like these different diffusion models, but the main also other thing is that they disentangle like here like this representation the 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 gaussians are basically you can learn this deformation mlp like the deformations only with the text to video model and you you learn the static part only with um only with the text to image models so you can get high quality and um don't degrade the quality with the text to video diffusion model Um, yeah, okay, to summarize this work, so this can generate from any text uh, dynamic 3D assets, and it uses like um, the formable 3D Gaussians, which are guided by three different um, diffusion models. To look at some results. So you can see that they can generate like diverse objects with really nice motion. Um, I think one problem is that like the geometry doesn't look so nice. Like you can see basically all these points because it's like it if you zoom in, it doesn't look as realistic anymore as from outside, but generally it's like really nice motion, really high quality results and diverse results. And what they also show here is um, they can um, generate really long videos by doing like auto regressive um, generation. And what they also do is that basically the first and the last frame um, match. So they enforce this. So it's kind of a looping animation. And because the Gaussians are um, explicit, you can like just put them all together in one scene very easily and like have this multi-object scenes. Mm, yeah, similar to here. Which? To the pipelines though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how is the deformation uh, so the deformation like is basically supervised with an SDS loss using a text to video diffusion model. So you basically have already the static part pre-trained, and then you have like this deformation MLP, which maps from coordinates and time coordinate to a deformation, and then you can basically yeah use regular SDS to update the deformation MLP and the canonical like the the Gaussian, like the um, the static part, the canonical part is basically frozen, and you can just learn the deformations basically uh, using the text to video model. Is the deformation like just the rigid form applied to the coordinates too, or just yeah. the, I mean, like just the center points? Just the center points. Basically. So for the guidance for your single text to video model. Mm -hmm. You do that exactly, you like copy for some end frames and then you guidance entirely, like how, how it was done. So this text to video model takes basically, let's say 16 frames. So you have to render from your dynamic 3D Gaussian 16 frames. So like you input like as regular the X, Y, Z and like the time is also like 16 different time coordinates. 
And so by this, you have rendered like a video and then you let it basically denoise from the text to video diffusion or like using SDS loss. So yeah, you have to render all every time like a full video uh, from like a random view um, to let it guide by the text to video diffusion model. They don't show any like services or depth maps or anything? No, I think it's. Oh. How do I go back to the. Yeah, I think the. Yeah, I think this is very early work. So, like, even for text to 3D with Gaussians, it's. This looks actually better than all the text to 3D Gaussian works I, I've seen. So they basically saw two things in one paper. So it's not there yet, like the text to 3D. Like you can see if you if you're really close, you can see that it doesn't look like yet as good as like some nerve-based results. So it will probably take a few more months before this looks nice. So now they haven't like shown any. Um, any results. Uh, what they show here is also that they can, um, like here, for example, prompt this with running, so a dog running, and then change it to a, a dog barking, and then they have like some smooth interpolation between the two prompts, like uh, while training like this um, uh, dynamic 3D Gaussians, and then it kind of yeah smoothly transitions from one prompt to another, like from one action to another action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, it. Did you so for example for your paper you didn't have the conditions for mm -hmm. so it was just yeah so this is so the difference here is like that it's more disentangled, like you have deformations, but if you only have deformations, you can't also like, you can't model like new content. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, there's no like, uh, I don't know, fire coming, uh, like the fire here is moving, but it's not like new fire coming up. So, mm -hmm. or like, like if you remember there was this like water, coming out of the thing, like it, if there's no water in the canonical frame, like you can't deform it. So it's kind of, but in, but with only using deformations, the quality looks, I would say nicer of the motion because it's uh, easier to learn only deformation. So I would say the motion generally here looks much nicer. And also they use like a big, like they just trained the text to video model just for this paper. Um, so like I would say their text to video model is pretty strong compared to what is available like open source. There was one paper for nerves. This one is old, but they have like a deformation field and they also have like something they call appearance field, I guess, for new object introductions. And like so there was like nerve player, which I um, guess. So which has like deformation and also like newness field to introduce new content. So I would say this is the ideal thing, but uh, when I experimented with nerve play, it's really difficult to make it work. So I would say the easiest to make it work is like probably like a deformation-based approach. And, and yeah, but yeah, it would be nice to see more than deformation. Generally, I think this is really nice quality and just only in like six months, this will look even better. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and recording. Um,